Hi everyone, Steve here from RSM and welcome to our latest chapter of our Coffee Conversations series. Today I'm joined by Richard Hopkins. It's a great privilege to be joined by Richard and it's been quite a long time since we've, we've actually caught up. Richard is currently Professor of Practice at the University of New South Wales and I'll ask him to tell us all about that very, very shortly. Um, he's also the former head of operations for the Red Bull Formula One racing team. So Richard, uh, welcome. Uh, it has been far too long between drinks. Um, and on that topic, uh, this is all about a casual chat, you know, over a coffee or, or something that we, we like to enjoy. So tell us a little bit about your, uh, your drink of choice this afternoon. Well, my, my drink of choice this afternoon isn't my regular drink of choice. I've, I've kind of rushed in from the university back home and uh, needed a needed a water so I've actually got a sparkling mineral water on the go um, probably would be my drink of choice for this time in the afternoon but we are fast approaching wine o'clock so uh, probably be heading into the Sauvignon Blancs at some point within the next couple of hours. Indeed and uh, I don't normally drink a coffee in the afternoon today I've, I've made an exception um, today of course you can probably tell from the jacket it's St Patrick's Day so uh, I, I decided to dress in my very best green. I, I should have actually, you know, pre-worded you up on that. Have one, but, but in, in any event, it, it, is, it is what it is. So once again, Richard, thanks very much for joining us. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a pleasure. Um, perhaps before we kind of kick into the, into the deeper conversation, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, um, you know, who is Richard Hopkins? Uh, okay, Richard Hopkins is... Uh... 49 years old, fast approaching 50, actually next month, um, which, is, which is quite daunting, but exciting at the, ne at the same time. Uh, Richard Hopkins um, was and still is a, a massive, what we call in the industry, a bobble hat, which is a, a massive fan of Formula One, uh, man and boy. Um, grew up loving motorsport ironically my my parents didn't drive and I didn't really have much exposure to cars and at the time when I was younger but maybe that's where the passion grew um, got a scale electric set at a very young age and and started getting interested in in racing and maybe that's where the sort of competitive edge came in uh, and then wind the clock forward a few years from there was presented with an opportunity to work for a Formula One team at the age of 16, which really, you know, was, was an opportunity that I couldn't pass by. You know, I probably got tertiary education planned. Um, but yeah, I, I never thought that maybe that that would ever happen again. And there the journey started uh, at the age of 16, back in the early days of 1987. Uh, and my, my journey through the sport, through the business, uh, formed. Um, first five years at the Bradman Formula One team, really learning the ropes, uh, then moving on to McLaren, where I was a mechanic, traveling the world, pit stops and, uh, and fast cars, and, uh, and then things changed slightly in the, at the end of the 90s, and opportunities came along to get involved in the business operationally. Um, ironically, back then, as much as probably from the outside, Formula One was seen as being not only glamorous, but, but exceptionally uh, efficient in the way that it did things. But the, the truth is far from that. Technology was strong. Finance was strong. But, but the business acumen uh, and within the business wasn't great. So, uh, yeah, I set about sort of trying to change, train, change how not just that team worked at the time, but, but maybe how Formula One operated. And certainly when I joined uh, Red Bull in 2007, that's when things really kicked off and uh, had, had an open book to really change the way that certainly that team ran. And I think the legacy is probably still within Formula One and Formula One has changed strategically how those teams operate. So that's sort of the legacy I've, I've left behind in Formula One. So, hey, look, I, I've, I think I've worked in the cutting edge of technology all my life, and uh, and but then moved to Australia five years ago, and it's it, it's it, it's been a bit of a journey to try and find find the next chapter, what that should be. No, no that's fantastic. No, thanks for for sharing that, Richard. So. Um, it's a good segue in terms of in terms of next chapters because you found yourself as in this role of um, as professor of practice at the University of New South Wales and can you tell us a little bit about that and the journey that you've uh, 
you've just commenced, uh, I guess, in, in relatively recent times. Yeah, look, I've been, yeah, been at the university uh, for three years now, actually. Um, the, the roles change slightly, but it's the, the role is uh, one of a professor of practice. So I'm non-academic. Uh, I can still call myself a professor, mm -hmm. even though, as I alluded to earlier, I never actually went to university. So unfortunately, my mother is no longer around. But if she was still around and knew that her son who never went to university can now be called a professor, I still laugh when anybody addresses me as professor. It's hilarious. Uh, but I'm very proud of it. Uh, it's an amazing role to have. And uh, I think UNSW have been quite progressive with how they've introduced Professor of Practices into, into the university across all the different faculties. Mm. And it's really introducing that industry, that level of industry excellence within, within the schools and within the faculties. And uh, I was invited to come along and join uh, UNSW working on some, what were student projects at the time, but quite high profile student projects in, within engineering. Um, and really it's been trying to uh, raise the profile of those projects and now I find myself with with one single project uh, but with with absolutely huge ambition uh, and that's the the Sunswift Racing solar car team um, that once upon a time not too long ago was uh, an extracurricular mm. project um, you know um, voluntary um, but but maybe and I, I can say this maybe a little bit misguided, not really structured, uh, and not really uh, reaching the potential that was lying within, uh, and that needed unlocking. And um, really, uh, it, it, the opportunity that's there for the students within, uh, for the university itself, and for industry collaboration is huge. Uh, and we're certainly on that journey. We, 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 we made the, the project uh, um, a curriculum project. Mm -hmm. So it sits, it's embedded within the curriculum. Uh, so rather than students working all the hours, God send building solar cars, um, they, they at least now get units of credit. Mm -hmm. um, but I think what we do as a group of 45 undergraduate students is, is absolutely exceptional. And I, you know, Look, it's being run by a guy who used to run a Formula One team. So you can only imagine, Steve, that, you know, my desire to elevate maybe the professionalism. I think that's probably the right way of putting it. Um, but really creating something that the students can really be proud of and really can, when they do leave, if they do want to leave, um, they can look back and say, this has been an incredible experience. And certainly for me, I try and run it as close to a, a business as I can. So we bridge that gap from student to career. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hands-on, but um, what we do is we, we design, manufacture and build a full-size solar electric vehicle that's capable of 140 kilometers an hour. It has a range of 1500 kilometers. Wow. The car weighs 380 kilos. It's fully made of carbon fiber has a 40 kilowatt hour battery, five meters squared of solar cells on the roof, uh, and is really pushing the boundaries of innovation within. It is a true concept prototype, something that any business, I think even Elon Musk would be proud of, but this is built by 45 undergraduate, exceptional undergraduate students. Mm. Mm. So um, yeah, and, and you know, we're just trying to take it to the next level, which, which brings us to, the point of uh, the Sunswift Institute um, yeah. and launching that at the end of last year, uh, which is, you know, it's going to be a, a physical institute uh, rather than virtual. Um, so it is going to be a building where we are going to innovate, invent. And uh, I think the primary goal is to do things that people haven't done before oh. in the space of automotive technology. Uh, and I think we can do that in Australia. Why can't we do that? Oh, no, that's, that's a, it's a brilliant thing to hear. And the fact that we've got so much opportunity in front of us as a nation, and, and here's an example of us really taking a leading edge. Um, interesting, just in, in terms of the parallels between when you joined the Red Bull Formula One racing team and when you joined the University of New South Wales, and based on our past discussions, there seem to be some parallels there in terms of the, where 
that team ended up uh, and and that's everyone knows that where Red Bull is is now to where it was once upon a time. Is that a fair comparison in terms? Oh, yeah. of... yeah, I'd yeah. like yeah, I'd like to think so. And I think that's that's maybe a little bit of me, and that shows maybe some of my ambition. Um, no, never wanting to just be a part of something, always wanting to take the initiative and create something. Um, and yeah, there definitely is parallels of walking into Red Bull back in 20, 2007 and. Uh, um, ironically, I, I, I probably took, took about six months of bedding in, which included attending lots of meetings at Red Bull and pretty much not saying a word, which if people who know me well, when they hear that, think that's absolutely impossible for you to sit in a meeting and not say a word. But I did. I was just, you know, just uh, taking in and understanding where the team were and uh, hatching my plan to move us forward. And at the end of that period, announcing that we were going to become winners and we were going to become world champions. And that to many was met with a bit of disbelief, but, you know, a um, bit of dogged ambition sort of plugged away, built the team, built a winning team. And, and yeah, the rest is history. We went on to win for, in my time anyway, four world championships and, and 50 Grand Prix. And uh, I suppose that still that um, ambition in me. And I, I guess I alluded to it before, you know, arrived here five years ago and wondering what that next chapter was going to be. And not for me, I, you know, a selfish ambition to, to do something exceptional and uh, that was going to satisfy myself, my own itch that I needed to scratch. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, hopefully everybody at Red Bull would agree, you know, we all became world champions, you know, yeah. not just me. We all, yeah. you know, 900 people became world champions. And, and hopefully I can, hopefully that can be one parallel that does, you know, uh, exist in this next journey is that lots of people can become yeah. successful and fulfilled. And hopefully if they've all got uh, itches to scratch, this one's going to be the one that does it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a wonderful story, and really look forward to to seeing the future of what you're what you're what you're leading and creating. And so, I guess just um, moving into the kind of the current environment where we're at the moment, and uh, no one would have guessed, you know, a couple of years ago, even eighteen months ago, that we would have been living in a pandemic. Who would have thought? Um, that's the sort of stuff of Hollywood, not not reality, mm -hmm. but the reality it is reality. Um, keen to understand what challenges, uh, and perhaps it's in relation to the development of the Institute at the University of New South Wales, and perhaps it's in relation to, 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 to broader issues than that, but what challenges you've had, met with and had to deal with over the last 12 months? I, I, I don't think anything sort of that sits outside any a story anybody else could tell, really. Um, I think mine is more about, I th yes, th there's obvious challenges, Steve, but, you know, to be perfectly honest, you know, compared to many people in the world and other mm -hmm. countries in the world, I think it would be wrong of me to, to I, I think the challenges I've probably experienced are just, you know, fairly minor compared yeah. to others, really, to be perfectly frank. I, th I think for me, I, 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 I'm absolutely certain that the, the pandemic created the opportunity. I don't yeah. think I would have, uh, this would have manifested itself without it. Um, I, I think before, before 2020, I, I was questioning what my next steps were, very happy at the university, but didn't really have something, I didn't really feel purpose. Mm -hmm. um, those times in Formula One, I, I definitely found my purpose. I understood that this was my calling, if you like. Um, even my days of being a mechanic, um, I, I jokingly say to people, and maybe work colleagues would agree with this, that I wasn't a very good mechanic. And they said, but, well, you must have been. You, you know, you were working for McLaren and, you know, Ayrton Senna and Alain Prost and people like that. You can't be a bad mechanic and get away with it. Um, but I, I didn't feel, I, I, I think then I was feeling a bit of imposter syndrome, possibly, yeah. until I went on to the operational role at Red Bull and I, I flourished and certainly felt that that was my thing and, and, and realised maybe this, that's what I was good at. Um, then trying to understand what this next thing was and it, the pandemic 
uh, and the environment. And I, I think just, okay, this isn't great, clearly. And, and as you rightly said, you know, who would have believed mm. two years ago that we would be in the situation we're in? I think we're very lucky to be living in the country we're living in, Steve, obviously. And, and it hasn't been easy for many, but it's maybe it, overall been, been, been a much easier ride than many other countries. But I think for me, I was, I was, I was looking at an opportunity for myself of um, a bit of a moonshot of uh, mm -hmm. setting up my own business, maybe. Uh, but then... I don't know, woke up, the, the, the penny dropped that maybe creating an institute at the university was uh, a better opportunity uh, where more people would uh, feel the benefit mm. of, of it. Um, but to go back to your original question, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to come up with an answer for that, Steve, because I don't think yeah. it would be, you know, my, my struggle would be working with 45 undergraduate students who don't get out of bed until midday and then you're trying to get them on a team's call and they don't, they're not there yeah. and got their cameras on, you know, I, you know, not being able to catch up with friends and family. Look, I've still got family in the UK and, mm -hmm. you know, not being able to jump on an aeroplane and go and visit them has been tough. Um, but I'm healthy. They're healthy. We're going to be able to do it at some point. So I think you just, you just, you, you just deal with that. If that's yeah. the biggest problem I've experienced over the last 12 months, well, that's what it is. Mm. Yeah. No, look, thanks for that, Richard. I think it's um, it's <clears throat> it's great to hear that because I think you're absolutely spot on. We we do talk about, you know, the challenges, and obviously there have been challenges. There have been challenges for businesses. There have been challenges for us as individuals. But it is important, I think, for us sometimes to sit back and take stock and think how fortunate we are living in Australia um, you know, where, where COVID absolutely is having an impact on our day-to-day -day lives. But if we think about in nations, nations such as the United Kingdom, Brazil, United States, it's, it's a very different yeah. thing. So yeah. um, you actually dealt very well with my second question, which was um, the follow-up question, which was about opportunities. So <laughs> okay. here, you, here you answer the, the question around challenges in a more positive way, I, I think is fantastic, because it really shows that you know, this is a time, you know, they say in times of adversity, sometimes the greatest opportunities arise. And I think we've seen that. And um, you've certainly demonstrated that with what you're, what you're endeavouring to achieve at the University of New South Wales. So uh, really appreciate that. So Richard, um, look, once again, really appreciate the opportunity to catch up. Um, thanks again um, to, for sharing the sharing your time with me and having a chat and uh, I'm looking forward to us. It has been a while, Steve, since we last caught up. I think the last time I didn't have a glass of, I think we had a glass of red in our hand. I, I think probably. we did. And, and I'm thinking <laughs> before too long, we're going to have a glass of red in each hand again and we're going to be doing it face right. to face. So Richard, thanks again. Really great to see you again. Yes, um, and for everyone watching out there, thanks for joining us. I'm sure you heard some fantastic words of wisdom from Richard. Uh, if you want to know more, you know where to find me. Um, don't hesitate and look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks again, Richard. And yes, Steve. Great. Bye now.